Well, church, let me encourage you, if you would, to grab your Bible or grab one of the Bibles around you in the backs of the seats and turn with me to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two in the New Testament. We're gonna wrap up a a series that we've been in this morning uh, from Philippians two. And then next week, we turn our attention to the Christmas season. So with that in mind, I do wanna draw your attention to this little red, little booklet handout that's in uh, your seats or or it's at the end of one of the, the rows you're sitting on. In fact, if you've got a stack of those beside you, would you just grab them and go ahead and pass it down the row? We want everybody to have one of these. This is just a little Advent guide that we have put together for the Christmas season that our our, our team compiled so that you can have something to kind of guide you through the Christmas season to remind you of what this season is all about. There's devotional readings in here. There's there's kind of a weekly focus in here. There's even a a, a Christmas music playlist in here to to keep you uh, focused on what this season is all about over the next few weeks. And so we hope you'll take this home. Use it in your quiet time. Use it with your family. Use it at the dinner table, however you see fit. But let this be a little guide, a little resource for you as we step into the joy of the Christmas season. A lot more to come about Christmas, but we want to put this in your hands here today. And we also don't want to just blow past Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving is a very uh, important week for, for so many. And I know many of you are going to be gathering with family and with friends and many are going to be traveling. And, and we just want to go into this week with, with, a, with a biblical perspective, with a biblical even worldview, thinking about the significance of, of a week like this causing us to stop and pause and remember the reasons that we have to be grateful. And the word of God here in Philippians 2 makes this really, really clear that this is of the utmost importance for the people of God. That this is not just a cultural uh, moment where we stop and say thanks for the, for the good things in our life, but, but this is to be the very heartbeat, the very foundation, the very lifestyle of the people of God. Philippians 2, 14 through 18 is where we're going to spend time this morning. And I would like to invite you, if you're willing and able, to stand up with me for the reading of God's word. And I, I know we were just seated, but I want to invite you to stand back up with me. And if you're new to Shades, the reason we do this is so that every week when we turn our attention to the scripture, we can be reminded that the word of God is where we make our stand. It is the foundation under our feet. The word of God shows us what we need to see. What God says is right and good and true. So listen to the word of the Lord, Philippians 2, verse 14. Do all things, the scripture says, without grumbling or disputing. And every parent said, amen. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may, uh, so that at the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I'm to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord, a very important word of the Lord for each and every one of us as we think about our perspective on our life and the way we interact with those around us. Let's ask God now to guide us through this word. Let me pray for us and then we'll be seated together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that it is to gather together as your people, to gather together seeking to hear from you. I pray, Lord, That as we now turn our attention to this living, active word that that reads us and does work in our lives, Lord, I pray that you would use this word to speak life and truth and grace and goodness and mercy into our lives. 
for oh, how we need to hear from you. And oh, how it may be true that we can find many reasons in this life to complain, but your word is reminding us today that if we are in Christ, we actually have many reasons more to be grateful. And so I pray that that truth would permeate our lives and our hearts here today and that you would show us what we need to see so that we, as your people, can live the Jesus way. Thank you for this time and together. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. This is one of those texts in the Bible that I believe speaks to each and every one of us in a very specific way. It's going to speak to us individually. It's also going to speak to us collectively. And I believe it's a word that we need to hear, especially in the state of Alabama. Let me tell you why I say that. I was doing a little research this week uh, around complaining in our culture. And I actually found a research project this week that that sought to, to understand and determine where do people complain the most in this country. And so they actually surveyed people from all 50 states and they were trying to determine where are the biggest complainers in America. And here's what they found. Number two on the list, the great state of Alabama. We complain more than anybody in the country except for the people who live in Mississippi. Aren't you grateful that you're not Mississippi, right? So I know we need to hear what the Word of God says about grumbling, complaining, and disputing. What does the Word of God say? The Word of God makes it really, really clear. Philippians 2, verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. I want you to know, let's do a little Bible work here. In the original Greek, the the word that is translated here for all things, it means all things. How about that? The Bible is literally saying to the people of God, the call for you to live in light of what Jesus has done for you is to do everything that you do in every circumstance, in every situation, in every day, in every moment, with everyone you interact with, with, do all things without grumbling or disputing. In the original language, this word that is translated grumbling, it it has this kind of deep, guttural meaning. It literally means the the murmuring, like the deep murmuring and mumbling that flows out of self-centered disappointment. Like when somebody doesn't have things go their way and they kind of are walking through the hallways and they're just, I can't believe he did that. I can't believe that. I can't believe I can't. The way they did it. And they're just just mumbling to themselves in self centered disappointment. This word translated grumbling, it also shows up in an interesting spot in the New Testament. Luke chapter five, verse 30, we see the way some religious leaders respond when they see that Jesus is spending time with, with, with Levi, a, a tax collector who now is following Jesus, and, and he, he holds a, a party at his house for his friends to meet Jesus, and Jesus is there with these tax collectors and these known sinners, and look at what the scripture says, Luke five thirty: the Pharisees and their scribes grumble Grumbled. They grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Of course, the appropriate answer to that question is because that's the only people Jesus could eat with. He didn't want to eat by himself, right? So the only choice is sinners. And so that's who Jesus always was eating with. But the Pharisees and the scribes, they didn't see themselves that way. They thought they were better than the known sinners. And so they're grumbling, they're mumbling to themselves in self-centered disappointment that, that Jesus is spending time with people that they considered unworthy. 
They're mumbling to themselves in self-centered disappointment that he's not paying more attention to them, but instead is paying more attention to these known sinners. How dare Jesus? They're frustrated. They're disappointed. And the word of God is saying to us here in the scripture that this is not to be the posture of those who are followers of Christ. In fact, followers of Jesus Christ are to have a very different attitude of the heart, a very different posture than those around us. Why? Because of what Christ has done. The scripture is literally saying if you are in Christ, there is no place in your life for where it is appropriate for grumbling and complaining and disputing, where these things should not be circulating in your heart and mind or coming out of your mouth. And the reason the word of God gives should be obvious. Because here in verse 15, the word of God says that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. The scripture is literally saying if you are in Christ, there is a joy that you have been invited into in light of what Christ has done that should push out grumbling and complaining from your life and should stand out in the midst of the world in which you live where grumbling and complaining seems to be now a national pastime. It's everywhere. And the word of God is saying it should not be so for the people of God. But here's the reality, and we all know this is true in our lives. There is no question that you and I could form a long list of all the things in our life, in our culture, and in our world right now that we could very appropriately grumble and complain about. We could make a long list. It wouldn't even take us that, that much time. You may even be thinking of those things right now. You may have had reasons to complain this morning when people were not doing what they should have been doing and you were running late and things were not going the way you had planned and that person was not driving the way they should up to your standards beside you. And there are all these things circling around us that we could grumble and complain about every single day. But we are being reminded here through the word of God that over and above, church, hear this, Over and above all the reasons that we can find to grumble and complain, there is an empty tomb. Over and above all the reasons that we could find to grumble and complain, there is a risen Savior. And those who are in Christ have been given a gift that is so much greater than the whole long list of things that you might find to grumble and complain about. In Christ, you are forgiven. In Christ, you are covered in grace. In Christ, you have been given new life. In Christ, you have been given the guarantee of eternity with God forevermore. In Christ, you are called a child of God. In Christ, you are accepted by God. In Christ, you are loved by God. And so you may look around and you may see reasons to complain. But when you look up and you see what God has done for you in Christ and you are reminded that there is an empty tomb and you are reminded that there is a risen Savior who is seated on the throne, sovereign and reigning over all. If you are in Christ, you have far more reason to be grateful and filled with joy than you have to grumble and complain. So right out of the gate here in Philippians 2, the word of God is reminding us why this conversation is so important because grumbling and complaining and disputing, they are actually joy killers. They will rob you of the joy that should define your life and your story. Grumbling and complaining and disputing are joy killers. 
killers. And here's the, and this is why this is so important. It's not only true in our life. Grumbling and complaining and disputing can become joy killers in the lives of others around us as we grumble, complain, and dispute. Let me tell you or show you what I I mean through a quote that I came across this week in studying for this message. This is from Kent Hughes' commentary on Philippians chapter 2. He says, those who persist in such murmuring are not obedient to Christ and his gospel and are rejecting the divine call to work out your own salvation. That's referencing what we talked about earlier in our study of Philippians 2. He then writes, they impede their own souls, listen to this, and the souls of their brothers and sisters in the matter. They are the undertow of the body of Christ. Think about that statement. They are the undertow of the body of Christ, literally meaning that those who grumble and complain and dispute in the body of Christ, they literally are like a current flowing against what God desires to do through his people. They are literally an undertow pulling against, pulling away from God's best for his people, pulling away from God's desire and design for his people. Think about the visual of that, an undertow is pulling us away from the shore, pulling us where we don't want to go. And the scripture here is literally saying, as you grumble and you complain, you're walking away from what God has given you and what God has done, and you're oftentimes pulling other people with you. Yes, grumbling and complaining, it, it impacts our lives, but it impacts the lives of those around us. It drags others with us into our grumbling, complaining disputes. It not only impacts our heart posture and our way of thinking and our perspective, but many times it starts to impact the heart posture, the thinking, and the perspective of those around us and can lead us away from the power and the presence of God. There's a very sobering reminder of this in a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a different church, the church in Thessalonica or Thessaloniki, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says this, think about this in light of what the Apostle Paul has divinely inspired to been divinely inspired to say in Philippians 2 look at these statements in this letter to the church of the Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16 says rejoice always all right so do everything without grumbling or disputing here to the to the church of the Thessalonians Paul says rejoice always then he says pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, let me just ask you, how can you rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances when you are grumbling, complaining, and disputing? The answer is you can't, and you won't. And so the scripture is saying, hey, this is what is to replace grumbling and disputing and complaining. You are to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in every circumstance. And then look at the language here. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do you want to know what God's will is for your life? A lot of people ask that question. Well, the scripture here is saying, you know, well, one of the ways you can know God's will for your life is that you are rejoicing always, you are praying without ceasing, and you are giving thanks in all circumstances. That is what God desires for his people to do. And then look at verse 19, and this is where I want to just key in for a moment. This is so incredibly important. After Paul talks about rejoicing, praying, and giving thanks, he says, and do not quench the spirit. I want this to just sit here for a moment. And do not quench the spirit. 
See, here's the reality, and we often don't think about this because we often think, oh, what's the little complaint really matter? What's the big deal about some grumbling? But the reality is, according to the scripture, when grumbling and complaining and disputing begins to push aside rejoicing and praying and giving thanks, we actually can quench the spirit of God. Meaning, we can silence the spirit of God in our lives through grumbling and complaining and disputing. We can actually push aside the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of God when grumbling and complaining and disputing begins to grip our heart. Church, this is so significant. It is sobering, sobering to consider how many times throughout church history a move of God's spirit has actually been silenced or quenched by those who grumble, complain, and dispute. Church, don't miss this. This is so incredibly important. How many churches throughout church history have lost their passion for the mission, have lost their evangelistic zeal, have lost their desire to take new ground for the sake of the gospel because people within that church began to grumble and complain and dispute and actually push out the spirit of God. Oh, church, may it never be said of us that God used to move there. May it never be said of us that the power and the presence of God used to be felt among those people. Grumbling and complaining and disputing are joy killers that silence and quench the spirit of God and as a result have the opportunity and the ability to at the same time shut down our witness for Christ. And so we turn back to the scripture here Philippians 2, verses 15 and 16, and we are reminded here, this is so important, our witness is at stake, that Christian joy is a powerful witness. Christian joy in in a crooked and twisted generation is a powerful witness. Look back at the scripture. The scripture says that you may, verse 15, be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Now here, the apostle Paul is echoing a a, a truth that runs all throughout the scripture, cover to cover, Old and New Testament alike, all throughout the word of God, the people of God are called to stand out as different from the world around them. That's all throughout the scripture. That's what the, that's what the, the laws of the old covenant were about, that, that the people of God would be set apart, seen as different. And in the New Testament, all the commands uh, of the scripture are that the people of God would, would shine as lights, would set apart and be different. And here... In Philippians chapter two, the word of God is saying you're called to live in such a way that it's a, it's a sharp contrast to the world around you, that the, that the contrast of your life is distinct. It stands out, and it stands out in such a way that compared to a crooked and twisted generation, you actually are seen and come across as blameless and, and innocent and without blemish. Another way you could say this is, is above reproach. 
Now, please hear me. This is important. It's so incredibly important that, that we do not think that the word of God is saying, okay, so you got to go live perfect. You got to go be perfect. You got to go clean everything up and act like there's never anything going on in your life. That's not what the scripture is saying. In fact, the scripture is saying that it is the grace of God that sets our life apart as blameless and innocent and without blemish in the midst of a crooked and, and twisted generation. It is the grace of God, the finished work of Christ at the cross that, that sets us apart as blameless and innocent. It is the overwhelming gratitude that the people of God feel at the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of God that sets our life apart as blameless in the sight of the world around us. Because the reality is this. The more that we see and are aware of the grace of God in our lives, the more we will recognize our need for the grace of God in our life. Not, the le not less. The more you see and are aware of the grace of God in your life, the, the more you will recognize all the reasons why you need the grace of God in your life. And as you recognize your need for the grace of God in your life, follow this path, it, it will increase your gratitude for the grace of God that you have received. You will begin to see more and more how amazing his grace truly is. And the more you recognize how amazing his grace is, the more you rejoice, the more you're grateful, the more you worship him for who he is and what he has done. You see, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you realize that you need him. And the more you realize that you need Jesus, the more you see what he has done for you in his amazing grace, the more this elevates and increases our reasons for rejoice and our reasons to push aside grumbling and complaining and disputing. Because the reality is when you're reminded of the victory that you have in Christ and you're focused on what you have been given in the good news of that victory that defeated sin and death, it's really difficult to grumble and complain. You see, the reality is a heart of worship pushes aside grumbling and complaining. It's very difficult to worship and grumble and complain at the same time. Now, I want, I want to make sure we understand what I'm saying here. You can sing and grumble and complain. I'm not just talking about singing. You can sing and be upset and disappointed and, and focused on yourself and grumble and complain. That happens all the time. But a true heart of worship True worship flows out of the heart and flows out of gratitude and flows out of thanksgiving and flows out of rejoicing. You think about all the words that we just sang at the beginning of their service. They, they, they ignite our heart and activate our thinking to remember who Christ is and what he has done. And when that worship flows out of our heart and when our lives are lived as an act of worship, an act of gratitude, an act of thanksgiving, an act of rejoicing, it pushes aside grumbling and complaining complaining because we're focused on the victory we have in Christ. Let me just see if I can break this down in a way that we can understand here in this part of the country. We love college football, do we not? It's the best, right? It just means more. It's awesome. But here's the deal. We, we, we all love to watch college football. Most of us do. And when we watch college football, it's a roller coaster, is it not? Right? One minute, you are losing your mind and losing your salvation. And the next minute, you are celebrating in joy and in gratitude, right? And, and, and you, you do this, I do this. You're watching the game, the ref makes a bad call, and you go crazy. Grumbling and complaining is a nice way to put it, right? 
You absolutely lose your mind. And then the coach makes a boneheaded decision and you can't believe what a fool he is and how much better a job you would do than him. And so you lose your mind and you grumble and you complain. And then some 18 or 19 year old kid drops the ball. He only has one job and you forget that you're an adult and he's a teenager and you let him have it in grumbling and complaining. But then, and your team scores a touchdown. <laughs> and all of the sudden, you are giving complete strangers bear hugs and kisses on the forehead and high fives and fist bumps. And you are going crazy in celebration, in gratitude, in joy that your team found the end zone. And the sun is going to shine again, right? I want you to think about that. Next time you're watching a game, and think about how fickle we can be as it relates to our perspective of what our God has done for us. And when our mind is focused on the victory that we have, when our mind is focused on what we have been given in Christ, when our heart is ignited in worship and gratitude and joy and thanksgiving at what he has done for us, it pushes aside all of our grumbling and complaining about the refs or the bad play calls or the bad decisions someone made. Because we're focused on the victory. We're focused on the reason to celebrate. We're focused on the gift that we have been given. And when we do, it shines. It shines in the world around us in such a way that the world takes notice. Because you see, Christian joy is a powerful, powerful witness. But finally, as we bring this to a close here this morning. I want to take us into a little bit deeper water because the reality is you can hear a message about rejoicing and thanksgiving and celebrating and you can say, well, yeah, that's, that's all well and good when things are going well and good, but that's, that doesn't seem very appropriate when when life is spinning out of control. That, that doesn't seem very appropriate when someone is suffering or hurting. But the reality is, please hear this, this is deep water. Christian joy is not threatened by suffering. In fact, the context in which this letter is written invites us to see this very important truth. And, and, and I'm asking you to stay with me here for a moment because I know some of you right now, you are going through the ringer. You are walking through some unimaginable hardship. I know it. I've heard some of the stories of, of pain and difficulty. I know many of you right now are walking through something that, that seems unfathomable to some others in this room. You're walking through suffering. You're walking through discouragement. You're walking through loneliness. You're walking through heartache. You're walking through loss. And you can think, what in the world does a message of rejoice be glad, be thankful. What does that have to do with me and my story? Look at Philippians 2, verses 17 and 18. The Apostle Paul has these words that are very strange unless we understand the context in which this letter is being written. He says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Verse 18. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice. Now, what in the world is the Apostle Paul saying? Well, this letter to the church in Philippi is being written as the Apostle Paul is sitting in prison in Rome. He has been arrested for preaching the gospel. How unfair is that? He's been treated like a criminal for, for doing what God called him to do. He's sitting in prison, having appealed his, his sentence and going, I hope I can get out. I hope that, that I'll have the opportunity to be free again. But he does not know. 
The Apostle Paul has no idea if, if they're going to take his life in that prison. He has no idea if he's actually going to walk out of that jail. And yet, in that circumstance, that completely unfair circumstance, that completely unjust circumstance, where he has so many reasons to complain, the Apostle Paul says, yet I rejoice I rejoice with you all at what God is doing in and through your lives. And likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. What a testimony. What a powerful example. Even as I sit here in this prison, I rejoice. Even as I sit here having no idea if I will be a free man again or if they will take my life, I call you to rejoice with me. Why? Because we have been given a, great, a gift that is so much greater than any circumstances we may face. We've been given a promise. We've been given a hope. We've been given a guarantee of life beyond this life that is so much greater than any circumstance we walk through. For the Christian, the best truly is yet to come. So the Apostle Paul is saying, even as I sit here, even as I am in prison, I rejoice and I call you to rejoice with me, because I may be in a tough spot, and I may not ever get out of this tough spot, but I still know that my Redeemer lives. And for that reason, I rejoice, because I know that as my Redeemer lives, one day I will be with Him living forevermore. That's why Paul can write these amazing words in one of his letters to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, he said, so we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Though the outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. And then these amazing words. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They change, they fade away, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The word of God is saying to you and to me, regardless of what you are walking through, if you will fix your eyes on Jesus, if you will place your life uh, firmly on the gospel, if you will look up and see what Christ has done for you and the victory that he has declared over your life through the cross and the empty tomb as your sin and your shame has been dealt with one once and for all, and you have been forgiven, covered in grace, and called new. It will change everything. And it will give you a perspective, a vision, and an invitation of rejoicing always, giving thanks in all things, and living in such a way that shines as a light in the midst of a world that is wandering in darkness. Church, this week is Thanksgiving. But for the follower of Jesus Christ, literally every day is Thanksgiving. We have been given reason to be grateful. We have been given reason to stand out as different. And we have been given reason to know the best really is yet to come. Because there is coming a day for all who are in Christ when this light and momentary affliction will just be a thing of the past. And the eternal weight of glory will be beyond comparison. It will be so much greater for those who trust in Jesus. So church, we wanna provide the opportunity just to fix our eyes on Jesus right now. We're gonna have a word of prayer. 
We wanna lift our voices after we pray and we wanna sing together. And we wanna remember that we have a savior that has done so much for us that regardless of what we may face in this life, we have reason to be grateful. Let's remember, let's, let's be grateful, let's be thankful for who our God is and what he has done. And let's cry out in victory at the incredible gift we have through Jesus. We also want you to know, you may be here today saying, I'm not really sure about all this joy talk and rejoicing and thanksgiving. I, I don't feel that right now. That's not been my experience based on my journey. And maybe you're here going, I, I, I'm not really sure about Jesus, but we want you to hear and we want you to know that Jesus in his love for you is sure that if you trust in him, you will see your entire perspective change. And you'll be given a gift that is unlike anything this world has to offer. And so you may be here today recognizing your need for a savior, recognizing your need for a new story, recognizing your need for a new life that Christ alone can provide. We wanna give you the opportunity as we pray to trust in Jesus, to receive salvation, to receive his mercy and his grace. And we wanna go before the Lord right now. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the good news of the gospel that declares there is an empty tomb. There is a savior who has risen. That savior is Christ the Lord. And he has done for us what we could never hope to do for ourselves through his death on the cross and through the power of his resurrection. So Lord, I pray for your church right now that your church would fix our eyes on the finished work of Jesus Christ that today we would look up and be reminded of the reason why we can rejoice in all things. We can give thanks in all things. We can shine as a light in the world around us in all things. Because the tomb is empty and our Savior has set us free to live with him forevermore. Father, for those who are with us that have never received this good news, we pray that today would be the day that they would recognize their need for a savior, that they would recognize their need for, for a new story, for, for, for the invitation to be called a child of God, loved, accepted, and approved by God because of what Christ has done. I pray, Lord, that you would give them the faith right now to simply say, Jesus, I am ready to follow you. I trust you with my life. I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. Jesus, I am ready to call you my Savior and my Lord. Oh, Father, how we praise you for the gift of salvation, how we praise you for the lives that are changing in our midst, how we praise you for the countless reasons you have given us to rejoice because of what Jesus Christ has done. I pray, Lord God, that our eyes would be fixed on the hope that we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing together. We're going to respond in worship. We're going to lift our voices in light of what the word of God has laid before us. And as we sing, and then at the end of this service, as we dismiss, we're going to have some of our, our, our team down front. We'd love to pray with you. If you've got something on your heart and on your mind that you know you need someone to pray with you about, we'd love to pray with you. And if you're here today knowing you need to begin a relationship with Jesus, Christ, we invite you to come for it as well. We would love to talk with you about the most important decision that you can ever make, trusting your life to Jesus. Let's sing together and celebrate what God is doing.